5, I believe, is the one that I have for the uh, 6, John chapter 6. John chapter number 6. You know, the Bible talks about that, Benjamin. I think they call it the dropsy. John chapter number 6. What's really bad is when you're preaching and you pick your Bible up and all that stuff falls out. Our preacher in Virginia used to say all the time, find your place, and then he said, put your birth certificate or your four-leaf clover or something else that you have in your Bible in that place to hold that place or whatever. <laughs> Amen. John chapter 6, verse 5, the Bible says, When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he saith unto Philip, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? And he said, and this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. You know, as we look at this passage of Scripture, uh, let's ask and then answer a few questions. To set the stage, here we find the Lord and his disciples. Uh, they have been ministering to the people that had been following, teaching and healing them of various illnesses. And uh, John says something unique in this passage of Scripture in verse number 2. He says, and a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles, which he did on them that were diseased. Uh, this verse tells us something that the other gospels do not tell us, and that is it, that these folks were following, the Bible says, because they saw his miracles, which he did on them that were diseased. John's gospel is the only one that points that out about this uh, passage of scripture. And uh, I looked at the different version, uh, not versions, but different uh, gospel accounts and found this to be unique to John's gospel. And uh, because they saw his miracles, which he did on them that were diseased, uh, what was the reason that they followed? You know, there's going to be a lot of people who will come to our church for various reasons. And um, I've been doing a lot of research on that and trying to use different ideas to increase our traffic at the church. And when I mean traffic, just people visiting. And uh, we saw the result of some of that work today with uh, Brother, is it Kanye? Kanaya. Kanaya. Uh, came from UVM. Brother Steve and, and David were out on the campus at UVM on Friday passing out some new literature that we've written. And uh, he was interested enough to come and so what can we do to increase traffic? Because different people are going to come here for different reasons. I got another phone call this week from the director of uh, elderly care from UVM, the medical center. She is an advocate for elderly folks that come from around the area. And uh, they're wanting to go to church, a lot of them. And a lot of their churches are still closed. And so she called on, I think it was Friday, and asked, hey, are you guys open and uh, is it okay for people to come and visit? You know, and uh, that question just was perplexing. Well, of course it's okay for you to come and visit. Uh, but you know, I gave her the information that I had, and, and she said, well, I'm going to let the people know. Now, I didn't see anybody from there today, but we did see the result of, of the other thing. But I say that to say this, there's going to be a lot of people who will come for various reasons and you know what? It's not any different than it was in the day that the Lord was doing his ministry with the disciples. Because in that verse that we just read, we saw that many of them were following because of what they had seen. And we're going to get folks here the same. Some folks are going to come here because of something that they might see or they might hear about or whatever. Uh, but in that verse number two, uh, he does say, because they saw his miracles, which he did on them that were diseased. Now, that's not the subject of the message. I'm just telling you that that is in here. It's in the text. And it tells us something that the other Gospels did not tell us. Now, what was the reason that they followed? It probably wasn't because they wanted to hear a bunch of deep spiritual truths. The Bible tells us that wasn't the case. They came and followed Christ because of the miracles of healing people that were diseased. And the truth is... We have the ability within us as a church and within a body of believers 
to do the same thing for somebody today. I'm not talking about healing ministry, but I'm talking about giving them something that they cannot get anywhere else. Most churches are not going to give folks what we have to give. Uh, hence the problem with the lady that called. Most of the churches are not even open. I mean, I know a lot of people who would say that they're Christians. Their churches haven't been open since March of last year. And I ask myself, why in the world would a church not be open for a whole year? But there's another unique detail here. Look at verse number 3. The Bible says, And Jesus went up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. This is another unique detail about John's gospel. He's the only one that says it that way. Uh, the other gospels talk about getting away to a desert place or a desert place or however you want to say it, uh, to get away from the people. But notice in that verse that I just read, John 6 and verse 3, And Jesus went up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. Why is that important? Because... This is a unique detail of John's gospel. The word sat in our English language is pretty universal. Uh, if I was to tell you that I'm going to, if I went to a place and I sat, what would that mean? It would mean that I maybe sat in a chair. It maybe means I sat on the floor. It might mean that I sat Indian style or whatever you want to say. But here in this text, if you do a, a study of this word, going back to its root, what it means is that they reclined. They sat and they reclined. And, and I thought that was a cool picture because, you know, I'm thinking about it. You know, uh, when we were kids, we used to, uh, my grandmother lived out in the country and she had an old farmhouse all around that farmhouse with just rolling green fields. You know, in the summertime it was hay. Of course, in the middle of the summer it's pretty green. and So tall green grass and a lot of it was going up slopes of hills. And when we were kids, we would go there to visit uh, my grandmother and we would go out and we would play in those fields. And, and, and I don't know if you've ever done this or not, but some of those fields, when the grass gets really long, if the hill is steep enough, you can sit on a piece of cardboard and you can slide in the summertime. Of course, we did it all winter too, but in the summer. But we used to run up those hills as fast as we could run. And then, of course, you know the rest. We would run down those hills as fast to try to stay on our feet. And oftentimes we would trip and fall. But we would run up those hills and, of course, we'd be out of breath. And you know what we'd do? We'd fall and we'd sit down and we'd fall back. We'd put our hands over our head and we'd just lay there and look up at the sky. This is the picture that we have here of the Lord and his disciples. Uh, they get to a, a place away from everyone. In uh, verse number four, uh, the Bible says the Passover a feast of the Jews was nigh. And, and so you have the Lord and his disciples. They have gotten away from the crowd to rest. And I picture them laying there with their hands behind their head. You know, they're laying on their backs, looking up at the sky, and they're probably talking about different things. I don't know. Uh, and, but then in verse number uh, 5, the Bible says uh, here, When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company unto him, he saith unto Philip, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat. So, you know, picture this. You, you find the Lord and his disciples, they're kind of, you know, laying back. They're kind of relaxed and sort of just maybe talking about different things. Some of them might have been sleeping. I don't know. But uh, you're sitting there and all of a sudden the Lord kind of, he's laying there and all of a sudden he kind of sits up and he looks and he sees, what does he see? He sees the multitude. He sees the multitude coming. Uh, when, when, then he says, but when he lifted up his eyes, saw a great company come unto him and he saith unto Philip, Whence shall we buy bread that these uh, may eat? And so, of course, this John's Gospel also talks about the Passover. The other Gospels don't mention that. Uh, but John mentions that the Passover feast of the Jews was nigh when Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him. And he told Philip, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? So Jesus asks a question of Philip, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? Remember, these are the same disciples. Philip is one of the same guys who's been around with the Lord for quite a while at this point. And uh, he's been ministering with the Lord. He has seen the Lord perform miracles. But yet, yeah, it's the Lord who asks Philip that question. It's almost like he says, you know, Philip, where are we going to get enough to feed these people? And I believe that was designed so to see what Philip's faith was like. Notice he says, and this he said to prove him. The Lord was trying to prove whether or not what he was doing was accomplishing the purpose. Whether Philip's faith 
was growing or not. Uh, Think about it. Whatever we do in the Lord, whatever we do at the church house on a Sunday after Sunday basis, a Wednesday night after Wednesday night, what are we doing? We're not just here to entertain. You know, if we were entertaining, I could think of a whole lot of other things that would probably entertain people more than me standing up here and preaching. Right? But you know, here's the truth. A lot of churches have gone to that. They're more about entertaining than they are anything else. And, and honestly, when you look at church marketing and you look at different things to increase traffic uh, into the church house, a lot of it has to do with entertainment and providing things that people are going to be entertained. And so that's at one end of the spectrum. And then over here you have just plain old Bible preaching at one, the other, other end of the spectrum. You know, can we find some place? You know, that will uh, help us to increase folks to visit our church. Uh, I, I think we can. And we don't ever want to compromise the preaching. In other words, when they come, they're going to get the preaching because that's the main thing. But here the Lord asks Philip, he says, you know, when shall we buy bread that these may eat? Remember, he had seen the miracles. They were present watching the power of God on display. And uh, the Bible tells us in verse 6, the reason that he asked the question, he asked, he said, and this he said to prove him for he himself. In other words, Jesus knew what he would do. He wasn't asking Philip for, an, for, for a purpose of, you know, I don't know what to do. He was asking him the question to see what Philip would say. And I say that to highlight Philip's response to Jesus' question. Verse 7, Philip answered him, 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may take a little. Now, uh, I've studied this out in other times, and they tell me that 200 penny worth is about a whole year's wages for the average man of that day. And uh, so Philip's basically saying, even if I used all of my, my resources and I took my entire year's salary, I, we couldn't buy enough. And that illustrates for us that that Philip's faith, even though he had been with the Lord personally, he still had a a, a problem in the area of faith. Philip was not convinced yet that God had supernatural resources available for every problem. And let me just highlight this. We serve the same God today. It's not a different God. When we read these stories in our in our these these accounts in the scriptures, I think oftentimes our tendency is to think, well, yeah, well, that was back in the days of the disciples and everything, and that's not going to happen today. But it's the same God. He has the same resources that he had in Philip's day. Uh, Philip is just like us. When he was asked the question of the Lord, what did he do? He immediately began to calculate within his bounds of reasoning. Or he began to rely wholly on his human reasoning and what he knew he had the ability to do. And isn't that just like us? Whenever we're faced with a similar situation, rather than say, hey, you know what? I serve the the God. My father owns the cattle on a thousand hills. I used to have a friend in Virginia who'd tell me that all the time. He said, if I need more money, I just ask God, he gives me more. Now that's pretty simplistic, but... Really, that's the truth. If you have short resources and you ask God, as long as you're doing things honorably and doing things according to his will, he will provide the necessary resources to get done what he wants to get get done. But what I want you to see in Philip is he began immediately when the question came, not to say to Jesus, well, you're God. You know, you're the Messiah. What do you think we should do? He immediately said, well, let's see. Uh, Even if I used a whole year's salary, I couldn't buy enough. And then the other thing, remember where they are. You know, they're not down on Main Street in the middle of a a metropolis. They're out on the hillside. So even if they had the money to buy, they didn't have anywhere around that they could buy that much for all those people. Philip had seen Jesus perform the miracles. Why didn't he say, you know, you're the boss. What would you suggest we do? Here's why. Because as humans, we're programmed oftentimes to go it alone. When we're faced with a tough situation, when we're faced with something that seems almost insurmountable, we go it alone. Rather than 
relying on God and saying, Philip saying to Jesus, you know, you're the Messiah, you're God, you can handle this. I, I have no way of my own to do this, Lord, but I know you do. Instead, what did he do? He simply began to go it alone. New challenges that come our way simply expose many times a weakness in our own faith. Because we all have the tendency to go it alone. So first of all, Philip basically showed his humanness. But second, Jesus knew exactly how he would meet the need. But a question of Philip exposed Philip's lack of strong faith. Because sometimes when you read these texts, you say, Philip, what are we going to do about this? It's like you ask yourself the question, why would God ask that of Philip? You know, it doesn't even make sense. But we know that it was to expose his lack of faith. Now, you don't think that if Philip snuggled even a little closer to the Lord and was walking a little close, you say, well, how could that be? He was with him. He was with him. He was with the Lord himself. So if you think if Philip struggled when his faith was tested, it ought to make pretty good sense that we're going to struggle. Amen. But the point is not to tell you that you're going to struggle because of your humanness. The point is to tell you, hey, we need to ask God. God is the one that can get us through these things. He's the one that can deliver us. And for Philip, this simply uh, illuminated the problem of his faith. And it assured him there was still room to grow. And that's the same for us as well. Every one of us has room to grow in our faith. We need to, we need to uh, make up our minds. Remember I said to you this morning, to get over angry, you've got to make up your mind. I'm not going to be that way anymore. And ask God. Well, in this particular case, we have to make up our mind that we're going to trust God for everything that comes our way. Not just the things that we can't accomplish in our own human power. And isn't that the funniness? That's what we do. When we can't do something in and of ourselves, we say, well, God, I've worked at this now for three days and I can't do anything with it, so what do you got? You know? And that ought not to be. We ought to say right immediately when something comes, Lord, I don't know what to do. We must stop trying to go it alone. Going it alone will never be the answer. You know, and you ask yourself, why in the world would Christians go it alone? I think it's because oftentimes we don't have God in the right place in our mind and our perspective and our hearts. We think he's the guy that we only go to when we get a diagnosis of cancer or some terminal illness. But he wants to be there with us through everything. You know, imagine if it was your own child maybe a five or six year old little boy or girl, and you said, you know, I want you to come to me anytime you have a problem. And they never came to you, even at five and six years old. Wouldn't it seem kind of strange? I imagine that's the way the Lord feels some, at times. When we put ourselves, when we take it upon ourselves to go it alone, we place ourselves in the weakest position that we could be in. But in contrast, when we say to God, I don't have this. I, I don't even know how to begin. H have you ever been in a place where you had to say to the Lord, I don't even know what to do. I don't have the first step. The only first step I know is, oh God. Huh? Have you ever had a situation in your life where you had to say, oh God. It doesn't have to be just for the, what we think of as critical things. We can say it for the smallest of things. When your anger is getting the best of you and you're losing the battle and you realize that you're destroying relationships, oh God. When we trust God, I told you that when you go it alone, you put yourself in the very weakest position that you could be in. But when you trust God, you're putting yourself in the strongest position. That you can be in. I find in this text it's interesting that God tested Philip with a simple question. When shall we buy bread that these may eat? Simple 
but profound. And that's my challenge for you this afternoon. Father in heaven, we thank you for our time together today. Lord, even though this has been a, a short, concise lesson, Father, we, we know that we don't have to, uh, uh, Lord, labor on things over and over for hours upon hours. But Lord, a lot of the principles that you give us through your word are simple, uh, so simple that even a child can get them, grab them. And Father, we miss those things most often because we think we need to look for more deep things. But Father, help us to be mindful that many of the great lessons of your word that you teach us are just simple things. If we would just do them, how much better our life would be. Father, we love you. We thank you for all that you do for us as a church. We pray that you would bless each family that's here this afternoon. And Lord, help them to have a productive week. And Father, we pray that you'd send a spirit of revival into the hearts of the folks. And that, Lord, next time we meet together on Sunday uh, when our revival starts, we'll meet Wednesday, Father. But on Sunday morning, you'll bring us to the church house prepared to receive uh, what you uh, have in the heart of the messenger that you're sending our way. And pray that you give him safety as he travels. And, Father, just help us to, uh, to have a good week in your word. And, Father, we'll thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.